Uh, Maria, Katie isn't here, so you gotta take a shot because we're talking about a song of ice and fire again. My water bottle's not here, but. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, you gotta do the. Oh, that was painful to drink, though. Hi guys, and welcome to another episode of your favorite podcast, Unresolved Textual Tension. It's me, your host, Maria, and with me today is my ruggedly handsome co-host, William. Hey guys, extra rugged, extra handsome. And what book are we doing today? Today we are doing God Killer by, I don't know the author's name. You know, this is her first book. This is her first book? Uh What? That I did not know. Yeah, I'm surprised. It's a strong, strong debut. It is Sarah something, I think. Hannah Kaner. Mm, close. Not close. Eh, white girl name. <laughs> very, very general white girl name. Like, remember how we were saying how Maria is like the basic bitch ethnic name? Sarah, Hannah, very white names. Anyway, we actually liked this book. It's yeah. interesting because for this channel, we usually either read super good books, books that are pretty good but have a major flaw or terrible or lukewarm bleh books or bad books. Um, and this one is like a just a really competent book. It's, it's a, not great, but it works really well. If I was going to rank it in our like ranking that we did for the the past year, toast the, levels. Uh, the toast levels. I'd put it in crunchy. Like I, I wouldn't put it crisp. There, there was opportunity for crisp. But mm. it, it would it would be solid crunchy, and not a lot of stuff went in crunchy that we read in the past year. <laughs> yeah, because we tend to either read books we know are going to be good going in in, or try to be, uh, you know, accepting of new books, and they all tend to be terrible. Um, and so, yeah, this is one where it was just like, oh, this it's really competently written. Like this is really. Good. How did you yeah. find this book? I think I read somewhere that the sequel is coming out, which it's not till next year so i'm not that good at research but i was like oh this might be kind of cool i am so surprised that a random book (laughs) you found was good it's true because so often they're not they're not we think they're gonna be like i i went in thinking it was gonna be like i i go in attempting to be as like i don't research what the book's about i don't read the blurb on the back of the book i never do any of that i go in blind and so sometimes i it it causes me to go into a book kind of neutrally most of the time i go in neutrally and this one just surprised me from the beginning with how competent like i just especially after you have to realize this is coming right off the heels (laughs) right off the heels of Aquawar, which was one of the most painful reading experiences of the past two years of our lives honestly this was this was great it was a breath of fresh air i felt like i enjoyed it reading it was a pleasure you know it didn't it and it really i'm i think i'm beginning to realize that outside of a few books i am built for stories that have a distinct goal and that's what they do I, I had a moment reading this where I was like, I'm so glad that they were like, we're going to go do this thing. And that's the only thing <laughs> that happened. And it was the journey to and the doing of versus a lot of epic fantasy, which is we have to do this thing. And then you go to the thing. There's a travel monologue. You go to the thing. There's like a mini little climax. And then they're like, now we have to go do this other thing. And then they go and they do the other thing. And then like, there's a little mini climax. And then now they have to go. And now you have another travel sequence. And eh, 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 and it's just your, <laughs> and they just last forever. Oh, for a book with a short, small focused scope. Ah, I love it. The other thing is that, and I've said this so many times on the podcast, but apparently authors aren't watching us. Don't try to do politics. Don't try to do slice of life. You're not good at it. A much simpler and easier form to master is the action adventure. And this book is action adventure in that way. We're not trying to sit around a house with like a beast and deal with like an eldritch forest. Because if you're not Naomi Novik, you can you can't do that. I, AKA or a la for the wolf, which I just always remember as being just a painful read because the author had no grasp of the thing she was doing. Um, and so like this is it's simple. There's a small cast. The relationships are, are you know, because there's only mainly three characters, the relationships between them are very uh, clear. She's good at writing. She's not great at like this is not the best prose we've read, but they're very competent. She, and more than that, she's good at writing different characters' voices. Not all the dialogue sounds the same, which is amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's fantastic that the characters have different, and, and 
There's no sassy characters. There is. Oh, God, I noticed that. There's not a single sass factory. There is two different styles of grump factory. But uh-huh. but that is different. And it. Oh, and, and this book also, <laughs> I was telling Will, I have a a trope that is a young, like t- early 20 something Maria I really enjoyed, which was uh, and especially like as a writing dynamic for when I like wrote when I thought of fan fictions or stuff like that, I loved the idea of like the competent domestic worker, like a baker, a housekeeper, a laundress, like who was, who was also competent and had like a secret history to her with the like rugged, grumpy, scarred up, badass, like a uh, warrior dude. And this is just a fantastic <laughs> gender swapped inversion of I loved it. It was it it, it it fits so many of the things I enjoy as a romance dynamic. It's not the great, greatest romance. I didn't ship it as hard as like, I mean, I'm not going to bring Ampersand and Cora into this. Oh. Uh, but even like uh, there was another book we read that I, I remember shipping a bit more. For me, this was it, it didn't have the juicy ache of the shipping. You know, when you're like, mm. Ugh. And and partially it's because these were adult characters and I was just like, y'all like each other. Y'all, <laughs> and I like it. I like you two for each other. It's like it's like two friends where you're like, I'm glad y'all got together. Like this was a really good choice for you two. And it wasn't overly insisted upon by the author. There was a bit of a slow burn. It, there was a natural progression. And again, the fact that they're adults actually helps a lot because they're just like at certain points you're like, yeah, they're just into each other because they're hot. Like, and 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 they both have like uh, fairly. Well, one of them has a fairly uh, open like sex life, so it's like this is not absurd for her to be attracted to somebody. Um, and so yeah, it was it, it was so much more pleasant to read than almost all the other romances we've read. Sarah J. Mass, eat your heart out. God, uh, it's so fascinating reading a book that bad, and then reading a book like this that just does so many of the things that book is trying to do and does them better again characters don't just sound like they're on a stage they're a stage play where they're just talking back and forth at each other um and it's just the author making hand puppets there's like an actual people sound differently they sound like they're realistic they have different voices um the characters are different their motivations track no sassy dialogue the one character who does kind of have sassy dialogue it's a situation where like the author realizes she's kind of like grumpy and prickly and she's not really supposed to like be funny or likable in the fact that she's like that it's it's a bit of a shirliness um and so those were elements that were so nice to read. And the world building is not my favorite thing. I, I probably would have gone in a different direction with it, but it's head and shoulders utilizing the ideas in it better than every other book that we've read, which had an interesting premise for the setting and then just completely dropped the ball. Yeah, it's it's insane to me how much more this engages with because you're really right there's so many books we've read that had a really fantastic premise or idea and then the world building just failed it and it felt very surface level and again i i was talking to will like the world building is a breath of fresh air it's not the best by far i would say the world building in three parts dead that one um i would say three parts is dead was a bit was much richer um, as far as the, the world building there, but this was like, it, it, the world felt given the premise, the world felt like it came from that premise mm-hmm. and that it was tied into that premise and that the things that you would go, huh, I wonder how this would work out. The author had thought about <laughs> a little bit. It's interesting. Cause like, it's not, it's a bit fantasy landia with, uh, uh, some other interesting stuff added and it's not. And I don't mean that, normally I use that in a really bad way, but this is a a fantasy setting that has a couple regions that were given that are distinct from each other in that, like, this area's people look a little bit like that, and and these are the different uh, things. Uh, But as far as, like, clothing type uh, and that kind of, like, the more tinier details of culture are a bit sparse, 
But cultural attitudes are rich. And when the main character makes a rude gesture, the author actually it's describes right. what the rude gesture is, which is like this-ish, I think. Yes. Um, yeah. And like that is a small detail, but it really adds to the world. Um, and it makes you feel like, oh, this is a real place instead of um, Akawar, where they're constantly making rude gestures, but you don't know what that is. Yeah, because she just says she made a rude gesture. And so you default. And, and, and what is happening is that Mass is just using the middle finger. Like, that's it. That that's mm-hmm. what is being used in that book, but she can't just say I flipped him the bird. So she just said I'm I made a rude gesture. It's great because like the the little symbol she has with the her finger is tattooed on her, and other people just think it's like ooh look at that cool tattoo. But somebody who knows what the symbol means under, and it's just like oh that's a cultural marker. This person is from a different place originally, and it it just has a lot of that kind of detail that makes it work really well. Um. It was solid. It it really was. I absolutely would like to read the sequel. A hundred percent. I went to look to see what other sh- stuff she had written and she hadn't. And so I was like, I'm a little disappointed by that because I'd like to read more stuff by her. But at the same time, this is such a strong debut. I am shocked <laughs> that this is a debut. Oh my God. I think this might be one of the best debuts we've ever read. I, I mm-hmm. like up there with Lindsay Ellis's Axiom's End. I don't know. I feel like in a lot of ways this is a stronger oh, no. work than that in it terms is. of coherence. It is much more <laughs> like so that had a better ship and like monster boyfriend, which we are trying Well, the for. alien stuff too was really smart, the sci-fi portions of it. But some of the more like mundane slash our world stuff was a little weak. And this is just like competent almost all the way around uh and so i actually i would say this is a better debut like it is fucking solid as a debut i'm i'm shocked and there are problems with it again that we'll get into as we go through but on the whole uh, again i go into these books with a deep dread in my stomach of like oh this isn't gonna be good like and and the thing is it's gonna be a matter of how bad it is um one of the things i was realizing is that like in terms of like analyzing literature often we don't do the thing where like we talk about themes and what the author is saying and that's because so often we're just dealing with remedial criticisms of a book that like is a thing they should be able to do and they just can't because they're not very good at their jobs but yeah i mean so we'll talk about we'll talk about the issues with it um but it's gonna be i think it's definitely gonna be interesting to it's gonna be fun to talk about because it's not gonna be just us either hating it the whole time or loving it the whole time. There's like a good mix of things. I would have thought this was like a third book. Like she'd written one series already and this was like the start of the next one. If you think about it, um, Shadow and Bone versus Deadly, not, what was it? What was that other one called? Oh, Ninth House. Ninth House. Like it, it Shadow and Bone versus Ninth House from co- like first to later co- more competent. It, it, like this i would say is more competent than ninth house and we we enjoyed ninth house i think part of it also helps that she she focused on a a premise that was easy or not easy but like she could it was manageable because two of the other books we've read that are debuts that were um nine fox gambit and grace of kings which were by short story authors like they really bit off a lot and then they chewed through some of it and then some of it was not baked yet to mix metaphors this one like again action adventure small cast of characters but she actually delivers on it well i cannot tell you guys how much the scope of this impressed me it is so solid she who became the sun was another debut so bad and it kind of reminds me of like like people uh like if you think of name of the wind which was also a deb- debut it's like people don't start with, <laughs> people talk don't about start scope with, yeah <laughs> people don't start with a small scope you know because she who became the sun also like it I, I, again if you start with the thing where we start the book where this is the thing we're going to do we have to do this thing and that is what the book is about getting to and doing that thing that is a smaller scope if you have nine things that the character has to go do this thing and then figure out the next step and then do this thing and then this thing and this thing and this thing it's gonna be much harder to make that work as a debut even writers who are pretty confident competent like for a first time that's all that's unwieldy no i mean again compare this to grace of kings or um the other one that I mentioned that I have now forgotten immediately because I'm old. Um, those are like both trying to be like political thing, uh, big political stories that break, uh, you know, general boundaries of like um, the 
the the genres they're part of they're trying to do something different with but like no this is simple and this plays to her strengths and again i think that's something that action adventure has gone out of the vogue for some reason like i was trying to think of other ones we've read that were action adventure and the only one i could really come up with was children of blood and bone which had all of its own problems um but like most of the time it's there's not a quest structure to them oh my god you're right oh okay before we jump into the plot um we have to uh honor some sponsors and those sponsors are our patrons patrons uh, we have a patreon and you can support independent journalism and feel good about that but also you get some other things maria what do people get if they subscribe to our Patreon? Oh my god, the bounty. She is plentiful. Um, first, if you join our first tier, you get to be part of our Discord, which is a treasure on its own. Do you like books? Do you like art? Do you like writing? Would you like people to talk about these cool things with that have a that appreciate our channel? So have similar like vibes to us and how we look at things? Join our Discord. We have artists. We have photographers. We have a, I mean, 90% writers. Like, it's just insane the amount of writers we have cultivated. That They have a, a writing-specific channel. They have a book-specific channel. They have stuff to talk about different videos that when other YouTubers post stuff. Yes, we allow our Discord to talk about other YouTubers' books in our Discord. Are we not merciful? Are we not benevolent? As kings and queens, well, one king and two queens. Cult leader is what I like to identify as. <laughs> yeah, okay. Not the kind of cult I thought I was going to have, significantly no. less um, uh, sister wives, but whatever. We can't all get what we want in life. So that's tier one. Tier two, on top of still getting to be part of the Discord and enjoying all that coolness and, and engaging with people, um, for tier two, you also get to be part of our book club, which means twice a month, you get to do a live stream with us. Uh, one live stream is where our patrons who are our book club members get to nominate books. We pick three out of those we would like to read. And then you guys vote on which one of those we will read. So you have direct impact on one of the books we do. Uh, also, to be fair, sometimes the mid-month, because our other one we do is our mid-month book, which we pick, but sometimes our mid-month book was one of the ones that got nominated <laughs> that we didn't, <laughs> that didn't get picked, or something that somebody mentioned, or things that we talk about. So being part of that you get to and then you get to experience it with us talk about it with us and it's like it's the best book club i've ever been a part of so i'd highly recommend it uh tier three things get real crazy on top of being a book club member and getting to be part of the discord you get to do the critique live streams with will and katie once a month the first saturday of the month usually um you get they will pick a chapter of something to read and look at it for the closer details of prose, language, and how those things impact a story as a whole, how to get imagery to work better, how to be more concrete in your descriptions, how what verbs are helping you versus hurting you. You want that info? Join our parasocial darlings tier. Those videos are exclusive to that tier. You're not gonna be find them here. You find like little snippets of them that I do um, when I'm not lazy and I actually do that. Um, and lately we went over a, a scene in Dune, which is now a major motion picture. So that's a kind of a cool thing. Uh, lo the month before that, we went over a sex scene that was terrible and we pointed out all the ways that it was terrible and how you can actually make yours better. Um, and I think that was actually really useful. I, I think of the critique streams a little bit as like my secret uh, jutsu and like an anime, like the secret technique, because like with each training montage, which is the, the critique stream, I go stronger as a writer um, because I really pick up a lot from them in terms of how the author does the thing they're doing. And um, having you guys along for the ride is really useful. You guys get to point out things as we go. And um, yeah, those are, I think by far, I think those are really really worth it if you're interested in a more micro look at the books instead of the more macro look that we provide here. Um, but yeah, uh, support independent journalism. Fight the man. Um, join our Patreon. Join us, guys. Join us. <laughs> Hi, guys, and welcome to our Indie Ad Corner, where we introduce you to new indie books that we have not read, uh, but we are advertising to help indie authors get more eyes on their products. If you're an indie author and you would like to get one of these ad spots, feel free to contact us at butisitgood01 at gmail.com. 
I think that's our aim. Hey, fantasy lovers, looking for something new to read? Do you like rich world building, layered characters, cozy towns, and dark secrets? Consider The Village of Lights, debut novel of indie author Madeline Muse. This new adult fantasy novel follows adventuring student Asha May as she's thrown from her world into one trapped in an internal night where not even the stars shine. There she finds the Village of Lights, one of the last civilizations of the dying world. They are devoted to the goddess of light, Luke's. In the village, Asha makes quick friends with the eccentrically dressed but friendly glowworm and the mysterious mass baker, Kira. She's enjoying the simple pleasures of small town life, but not for long. Asha discovers the village harbors a dark secret. The previous priestess not only went missing, but no one in the village even remembers she existed in the first place. As Asha brings the secrets into light, she needs to figure out who she can trust. Will she bring back the light or doom the village to darkness? Find out in Village of Lights, available in the links below. And now we shall actually do the plot. Um, okay, Maria, what's the premise here? The premise of this book is that uh, we are in a world that has for once a nice collection of nations that all feel <laughs> real and not like peripheral to like like you know sometimes you read a fantasy book and you're like this is one na- this entire th- one one nation no but it's it, basically this world has gods and gods here are um elemental but also like they're they're finicky they they shall bless but they shall curse they shall they'll give you good things but you have to give them things in return um and the basic the context of the start of this book is once upon a time there was a major war in uh the main land the the nation we're dealing with called midrand um where the old gods and the new gods fought there was a huge clash uh and the humans were caught up in between and then at the end of it the king of midrand was like no more gods in general. Just fuck all of them. Where they're fucking up people, you're no longer allowed to worship, and that has caused a lot of uh, problems within the land because a lot of people like the they like their gods and they were okay sacrificing some stuff to their gods, and now that gods are outlawed, that's no heckin' good. Uh, another bit of context: so we have three main characters we deal with, and this is basically a quest book. There, uh, everyone has a quest that they're going on all leading to the same place one of the characters is a character named kissin and kissin prior to the god wars uh and all of that she was from a different land called talisia uh and her family her dad her dad was the lover to this sea god called ocidian and and then the fire god hesta decided uh she she wanted them as a sacrifice so then their city that they lived in drugged her family and and burned them alive as a sacrifice to the the fire god Hesta. In the prologue, it is some heavy stuff. It is. It's literally a girl. You hear about like how her dad was lover to Ocidian, and these are her her siblings are all named after the sea. Like they all have names in honor to Ocidian. Da da da. And then she wakes up. She is drugged. Uh, she can't. And her family is being burnt alive. And her like it is just <laughs> like they. They and it's it's so good because like they she gets chained up like she gets tied up onto this like iron cage that they locked her family in and her one little brother is like he's going down first, um, but she like shreds through her ties with her teeth she ends up losing a tooth she tries to escape she helps her father and she ends up something falls on her and traps her leg and her father sees this and in an attempt to save her cuts off her leg. And sacrifices her leg and himself to Ocidian, the sea god, to save Kissin. It's so cool because you have just the image of him carrying her with her bleeding stump of a leg out into the surf and then, or on, out of the surf and onto the land. And then he drops her and he walks back into the ocean. And it's it's like almost something kind of biblical, almost as an image. Like, and so, and the thing is, this is chapter one. And and one of the things that I, I think is a, a, a testament to her skill. Maria, what is one of my defining characteristics as a reader? You don't like sassy men. Oh, well, first of all, it's bitchy men. Bitchy but men. Uh, also my contrarianism. Oh, God. Which is that when you... an author 
shows their hand even a little bit, I'm like, no, I don't like it. If you tell me in the first chapter that the evil empire killed your family, I'm on the evil empire side now. I don't care how many atrocities they commit. In this one, I wasn't like that. I didn't necessarily hate the villagers that were doing this, but I was like, oh, okay, I'm I'm understand. It felt like a real thing that was happening and didn't immediately make me go how evil they are. I think because there's a realism to it. So the one, the, the scene that I contrasted a lot with in my head was with um, Children of Blood and Bone, where she's in like a karate class in the first chapter, and then two of the like empire people show up and are like bullying them. Mm -hmm. uh, and in this one, it's like, it's not like that. Like these are people she knows and they're just gonna kill her. They don't really wanna talk to her beforehand. And it seems like a more reasonable thing. And they're doing it not for the sake of an evil empire, but to get riches. And, and so the basic idea is that this land had mainly, it's coastal and they'd mainly been gods of the sea that they, they worshiped. So Ossidian was the god of this city, but further up in the mountains, uh, it's either Hesta or Hesia. Um, the fire god who was also a wealth god and she was giving people wealth and, and you had to give up your resources. Like it, it, it reads a little bit like industrialization uh, where uh, what you got was wealth from this god. And so everywhere else around them has gotten wealth and has taken up the fire god. And so for her, her price for them to protect, for her to protect their city and to take them on and give them wealth was this family loved by this opposing god. And so, and it also, by having it as a whole community deciding to do this to benefit themselves, it feels like it's not one evil person and it, it's not an evil empire. It's humanity being selfish, which is something that is true. It doesn't feel malicious quite either. It feels like a very like, oh, this is, we got to do this for the good of the village. We're not going to call is, you. This like, is the price we have to pay. Yeah, exactly. And so to me that felt, and also like, you know, just religious people do act kind of weird sometimes. Um, and so there, it was a lot more believable and it put me on the character's side a lot more. And I think those are all small details that really made sense. Now, I do have to complain that I didn't like that the God's name was a citizen because I kept hearing as a citizen. And I kept being like, why are they saying that a citizen is gonna show up to save them. I didn't hear that at all. I heard Ossidian. If anything, it sounded like Osi uh, uh, Odysseus. Oh, that actually is kind of cool. No, it's I, I kept hearing a citizen. No, it's and Ossidian. Like, <laughs> uh, another thing, and I'm gonna mention this here, this book does representation in a really nice way where the characters just are who they are and they just exist in this world and there's not like, subjugation or so using children of blood and bone again uh that they are being persecuted because of who they are they're like and all of that stuff in this her family was just it, it was a family that got another god like that why they were picked but there are gay characters there are bi characters there are uh characters with special there is a ton of lesbians in this book <laughs> kissing is bi Ello's parents are both mothers there's three old ladies on a quest with them they also have mothers and then kissing's best friends also in a lesbian relationship that's five, four lesbian relationships yep. within like the first third of the book and we have a gay relationship her dad and the the and Ossidian, like that was and so like and it's just like it's just who they are the it's not like it's and and what i liked is it doesn't do what akawar does where like Sarah J. Mass, it's like she forgot to include gay characters in the first two books. And then she was like, oh, wait, I need to include it now. But I also have to make a reason why these characters weren't out and obvious before. And so it's this weird, like, it's accepted, but it's not accepted. It's it's not accepted here. And like, we're, so, we're, we're looked down upon here and not there. And in this, they just exist. And that's, that's the kind of representation I like. I have two mothers. I like, and, and for me, my mom's just existed in my life. And they were just two people. And, and like, were, were there certain things? that were absolutely harder for them because I live in this society, but I like seeing representation that is just people living as people. It's not their hurt. It's not about them being gay. They're not like, yeah. And it's just so nice. And then seeing a deaf character who is competent, who has the best job out of anyone <laughs> in the book. Um, uh, and then having uh, two characters who have uh, physical disabilities but are just like one's a total like it, they just 
they account for their disabilities. They have they have provided themselves accommodations, and it just works within the world. Nobody looks. It just is such a nice way to see representation that we don't see it because oftentimes. Either the author wants to be like, look, I did the thing. And they'll mention <laughs> that the character is gay 900 times or like, like, it's just like, they're like, see, 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 I did the, and it feels like representation for representation's sake. And mm-hmm. this just felt like, no, nah, these are who these characters are. It, it didn't feel like it was shoehorned into the story. Yeah. A lot of representation exists in this weird liminal or not a, liminal, a limbo space between like, this is a super, I, I'm trying to say something about homophobia uh, and through the themes of a society like this. And uh, it's just in the, like in this book where it just exists, there's like this weird, like, so Akawar is like, none of the main characters are homophobic. You don't really think the society is, but then the bad characters are. And so there's like a weird mismatch where it doesn't really make sense. And some of the other books we've read, the representation has also been like, like Maria said, like, look, I did, I did the thing. I get points for it. Whereas in this book, it is just much more uh, by the way, as the TV tropes go. No, no, no. By the way. The way. Yeah. Yeah. Good, yeah, good yeah, job. Clever. Good Thank job. You. Every once in a while, I did feel like the book was tipping its hand a little bit, but I was like, okay, that's fine. Like, it's 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 for the best. Like, I, I just don't like seeing the author's hand, but it's for the best. I get it. I enjoyed it. This was some of the best representation. And I just like, I was so thrilled that we were getting characters that we don't normally get to see. And they were just good. And they were good characters. And one of them, like, and they were main characters. Like, ah, if you compare this to the last character that had um, a a disability that we read, the main character, and how, Fourth Wing? Oh, God. And how badly that was mangled versus Kissin. My badass bitch, Kissin? She has a prosthetic leg. That's the one part of this book I didn't like. I wanted her to have a peg leg. I think that would have been so cool. I disagree. I think that her prosthetic leg is so much cooler. No, first of all, it's not really realistic. And second of all, she's would be like a kick-ass female character with a peg leg. That's so cool. You never see that. I don't need to see that. I don't want, I don't like, I, I, frankly, the idea, it, it literally talks about how when she had her peg leg, she'd get splinters all the time because of the pressure from her leg pushing down on, like. No, yes, no, 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 I understand, but I'm just saying, and the other thing is, it's like the only example of like steampunky thing in it. Like it's, it, it doesn't super make sense that she has this one really advanced prosthetic, whereas everybody, like nobody else has that. So I, that was my one note and that's all I'm going to say about it. Fair to that, but I would also say that most people didn't realize she had it. So th- I, I took that to mean that this is a thing that is probably just not visible. I just think it would have been cool to have a peg like. I, Cause like, it's unsexy. It's so unsexy to have a peg leg that I would have been like, that's cool. She also has a gold tooth. I love the gold tooth. Like it's a great character thing, but then it, I, in a visual medium, it would look so bad. So I like that. Cause the author very much is not trying to make Kissin like sexy lady. She's, she's kind not. of like a little butch and she's like a little rough around the edges. And I really liked that. She is the, when I was talking about the, the romantic dynamic I loved as a young 20 something, um, she is the gruff, hardened warrior with all the scars who's kind of like beat up and, and like not not the handsome guy, but like the like, er, like she's the female version of that. And I love it so <laughs> much. It's so good. Um, anyway, the rep here is really good. Read it for that alone. You'll probably have a good time. Anyway, continuing on. So that's Kissin's background. The we are taking the story takes place um, years after because that was when she was a little girl. That was our prologue. We're we're past the God Wars, and mm-hmm. our three main characters are uh, Kissin. Obviously, she is now a God Killer, a Vega. Um, it is a position that previously were just mercenaries, but now that the government and king is like fuck the gods kill them don't worship them she gets hired to go deal with gods who have started asking for more than just little trinkets you know because some gods will be like you give them a special thing and they're happy but once they start asking for blood uh that's when things start going downhill so she has she got trained when she was younger um as a god killer and that's what she does and it's really badass and it's the first scene where you see her kill a god is great it was a a nice setup and understanding of what the parameters of killing a god is and she trash talks the god a little bit which in another book would be annoying but here kind of fits her character because again the author and i said this about characters who are sassy um and like 
kind of trash talky is that the author can't be overly enamored with them or it becomes a problem. So like in left-handed booksellers of London, one of the characters is very like kind of um, funny sassy and like his family is over it. They're so like, okay, would you stop? Like, this isn't that like, stop it. And so, or L in, um, the deadly education books which is much more of a defense mechanism and it's not necessarily supposed to be like snappy comebacks it's just how she reacts under stress and so here there's in a sense that like yeah kissing is just kind of a grumpy person that people don't always take super seriously and you're not supposed to think she's badass for some of these things i actually felt like in terms of scenes this is the most like booky but that's just because the character hadn't been set up um and this is it's good so she's a, a god killer mercenary now um character number dos Inara. Inara is like a sheltered girl who's um, lived all of her life in a manner away from everybody else, but with her mom who goes back in other places. And she goes and seeks out um, Kissin, who is flirting with a hot barmaid. Let me state her mother is an important political figure. Like, like sh she's a lady. This isn't just a girl. Like, like it's not a merchant daughter. She it, Political with significance. Continue. Yes, she is of a noble house. And because she has a god problem. And the god problem, she doesn't know what to do with. Because she has a little... I thought of him as a bird, bat, deer, squirrel. Um, because that's kind of his combination of things. He's like a little squirrel sized God that can also turn into like a cat pretty much cat size, pretty much. Um, and he is Skeddy and he is the God of white lies and he is tied to her. Like they can't go very far from each other. Um, and they don't know why, because usually gods need, well, not usually gods need a shrine to exist and he doesn't seem to have one and people can't be a shrine. So they're not, nobody's really sure how the twice or no, not nobody. They don't know because they've never told anyone. So she's She's gonna go to so she's going to see um Kissin to see if they can get like this god thing removed or separated. And Skeddy is kind of a cool character because he kind of thinks like a god. Um, I'll talk more about how I, I wish that had a little bit more had been done with that later in the book, but like he has like a very creepy voice. In general, the voice actress I thought for this was really oh, excellent. Fantastic. I think she made some of the some of the dialogue really sings because like at the beginning, I couldn't tell if the author's dialogue was good or if the voice actress just was really good. Um <laughs> I couldn't, like, I was like, it just feels very authentic. And so he's kind of like an interesting character and he can talk to people. And obviously Kissin is not about that life. She does not like him. She does not like God. She kind of wants to kill him, but she can't. Our third character is uh, Illagast. And uh, he gets called Elo, which is what I will call him. Elo used to be one of the knights of the realm. Uh, in fact, the current King Aaron was his best friend. And what you learn is Aaron was not the favored royal child. He, His family didn't really care about him. He was the youngest. His sister was supposed to take over as queen. His mom was much more into her other siblings. And so, like, a Aaron often got left outside. So there's the old uh, capital, Blen Raiden. Um, and mom would often take the other kids in and not take Aaron in because, you know, not her favorite. And so he just ended up becoming a knight, like, and ended up in the military. And that's where he met, uh, Illagast. Um, Il is the character that has the two moms, um, and comes from like a merchant family. I like the idea of his upbringing. It was very nice. But anyway, uh, he, he has been a baker for the past 10 years since the war, just trying to avoid it. He didn't like the war. It wasn't great. He ended up leaving Aaron's service. Fucked off. Um, and Aaron comes back uh, to, well, comes to visit him in his little bakery. And Aaron's like, buddy, I I need your help. Can we, I need to, us to go to Blen. I'm going to go to Blen Raiden. I, I need to go. And uh, he's being coy. He's not answering Ilgast's questions very well, but basically at the end of their encounter, after having like, they bake together, they have a good time. And there's a, a nice sense of familiarity between them in that baking scene where this is obviously something that they did when they were on the road together. Aaron, despite being King knows how to handle this dough. Illogast is very, very into his dough and his yeast. <laughs> it's so funny throughout the book that like, he's so picky about it. Like he's a real, like, you know, like somebody offers him dumplings at one point and he has to pretend that they're good when he's like, Oh, they were underbaked in this and that way, which is really it's funny. Hysterical. Cause there's a point where like, he thinks he's going to die and they're going to be separated. And his like last thing is to tell that guy how to properly <laughs> make his dumplings. It's great. It's such, it's a much better usage of a character having a, Oh, you don't mean they just think about how they 
they should paint a scene. Yeah. Or or how the fact that, like, because I, I consider it more akin to Feyre being a hunter. Like, like oh, that's, yeah, that's what true. she did to survive. And then it just completely fades into the background and she never thinks about it again. It's never something that she craves to do to get her mind off of stuff. And, like, Illigas, when he's stressed, he imagines needing dough. And it's just, like, it permeates his character. It's like, yeah, this is what he's been doing for the past ten years. And I love it. I love Baker Boy. It's so great. Anyway, but at the end of their little night uh, and while they're eating... Aaron like kind of almost faints and gets really weak and he like shows uh, Elagast his chest and where his heart should be is a hole with a nest in it with a little tiny flame but the flame is almost going out and what you find out is that this king who has outlawed gods and the worshipping of gods had made a deal with a god um, to uh, save his life and so he now has the heart of a god this little flame is keeping him alive but it is going out. The god who evidently did this for him is reneging and taking it back. And so Aaron wants to go back to Blend Raiden so he can figure out, like, either get a new god to take care of it, but somehow figure out how to keep his life going because he tells Elo that there is a rebellion starting. There are people who are plotting against him and civil war is going to break out and he needs to remain alive to be able to keep this from happening. And Elo's like, absolutely not, buddy. No way, Jose. <laughs> Am I going to let you go there? You're literally the king. Civil war will break out if you end up dying between... And you can't disappear from... Because he's also like, I have a month before I'm going to die, basically. And he's like, you can't be gone for a month trying to do that. You have to be... You have to rule. I'll go do it. I will do this thing for you. So Elo decides to do this for them. He packs up his stuff. Aaron's like, thank you, friend. Like, I, I, I owe you big time. Um, and so he sets off. And what he's going to do is he's going to join a pilgrim trail to go to Blen Raiden Because pilgrim trails are kind of illegal right now. You're not supposed to go worship. But there are shrines. Uh, Blen Raiden was considered the city of a thousand shrines. So there are shrines. There, there are gods that are still there that were left in the wreckage of the city. And let me state that I love the idea of Blen Raiden as this, like, dead city with just these slivers of gods just surviving that people go to to pay homage and pilgrimage to and it's this dangerous just like k it's gothic it's ah blend right it's really cool it's a great concept um and i liked it the entire time they were heading toward it i was like i can't wait to see what the city looks like and then we saw it and i was like (laughs) oh the the the, like ghost gods which it's good anyway um now kissin and inara uh when they, Kissin is like, I, I can't help you. I'm taking you back to your mom. Let, let's get you to your house. But when they go back to her, because she tries to kill Sketty, Inara's like, don't kill Sketty. If you kill him, I'll die. Uh, and when they go back, uh, Inara's entire house, her manor that she'd been, like, is just burned. It's gone. Her mom's dead. Her, like, it, it, the the women that raised her as her t- uh governess nursemaids her like the head maid like everyone is just gone it is burnt and uh kissin this strikes a little close to home as one would imagine (laughs) um and there's a part where she tells anara you're lucky and anara is like how am i lucky and she's like you're gonna think that way for a long while but you are lucky in this moment and basically kissing's like now she's got this girl and uh she's like who are you and she's like i'm in uh, i am lesa Crea's daughter because nobody knew one of the other things is nobody knows inara exists nobody knows that mm-hmm. lesa Crea. uh now this is a name i will say i kept thinking it was lesser Crea, and i thought they were referring to inara as the oh, daughter that's so, clever no, yes, <laughs> no. but uh lesa Crea, uh, nobody knew she had a daughter. Like they just, when uh, they were in a bar at the start of the scene and somebody said, this is a noble girl's, a noble daughter. Like, who is she? They were like, ah, Kreia doesn't have a daughter. We have no idea who she is. Um, and Inara in that moment is like, why does nobody know I exist? <laughs> this is weird. Um, and, uh, but they go hurt. It's been burnt down. And so uh, Kissin decides to take her home to where she lives. Um, because someone she knows might be able to help or might know something about how to get the bond between them broken. So they go back to her house and here we meet, uh, some characters who are really great, who I hope we see again in the second book because I enjoyed them. But basically Kissin's found family 
is a woman named uh, Yaro and, or is it Yatho? Yaro and Tele. Yaro is in a wheelchair and uh, she is a blacksmith, but also a tinkerer. Like there's a lot of, uh, there's a moment where they talk about all the different things she studied to be able to get to this point. Um, And she's the one who made her uh, Kissin's prosthetic leg. And they've, known each other since they were children because one of the things you discover is when Ossidian dropped her back on the oh the the like beach and left her she had not used the thing to save her life she basically told him to fuck off because she didn't want to use up what was left of her father's like life offering yeah and so she was like fuck you and he's like all right fine i'll leave you and so she got picked up by um Basically, it's whatever that version of the Victorian thing is where they name the kids and then make them beg for money. Yeah. Uh, but for in Glenraven, which is explains why Yatho does not have or Yarrow does not have a leg. She just had this community of like she was forced to be like beggar. They were forced to be beggar children. And Tele uh, was very pretty and Mamie, the woman who forced them to do this, like scarred up Tele. And uh, she's the one that... Uh, can't speak and uh it well is deaf um and so the characters speak uh they call it sign speak or hand speak and it's really interesting because pirates also use this to flash signals across the deck when they can't be heard and inara's mom knew this and you're like <laughs> lady Crea, why the fuck do you know pirate speak madam um but it's interesting because the idea is this is something that is not just a lot of times we look at things that are, and I love this as a touch, a lot of times things that are designed for people with disabilities are looked at as like, oh, that's just for, I don't, but they benefit more than just them. Like the floss pick. Larger airline seats would actually benefit all of us. Oh, everyone. <laughs> it would benefit everyone. But there's a lot of things that people don't realize that we take for granted as day-to-day things that were originally put in place to assist people with disability, and now they benefit us as well. And this was one of those things where, like, ah, this is this hand speak, which people, like, it is not just used by people who cannot hear or cannot speak, but it is also used by people who can for other purposes. And I really liked that as a tie-in, but it, it works in really nicely. And it's also something that Inara and Kissin use throughout the book to to communicate privately with each other so it's not it doesn't feel like a token thing that just comes up and then never you never hear of again uh but anyway kissin's grumpy <laughs> yarrow is uh very smart and uh like doesn't take any of kissin's grumpiness and is like kind of yeah i don't want to <laughs> say like bullies her but it's like sit down eat what are you doing and like kissin gives all the money from her recent god killing to them and they're like what are you we're not going to use your money we both have successful careers because Tele and Yaro <laughs> are a couple and they're like we don't need your money she's like I got nothing to do with it you take it but I loved the scene because one of the first things she does is her prosthetic got damaged but she takes it off she sits in a wheelchair and she's just so relieved to not just be standing on the thing and like her uh like knee is free and like it's just this really nice like relaxing and a moment of uh there are a few moments where she takes off her prosthetic and it's her being very comfortable and vulnerable with the people around Mm -hmm. her there's a real detail to it that i think helps make it feel so again going back to um fourth wing and her um disability in that it was very undefined like i learned a lot about the syndrome she has by all the comments talking about how she didn't put in details. And one of the comments on that video had a bunch of very um, uh, insightful things about how that disability works that actually really would have strengthened the book if they had been in there. Like it's one of these disabilities where like you can think you're doing okay in the moment and then like there's some severe repercussions if you push yourself too hard, which is exactly what she does in the book and there's no repercussions for it. So it's weird she put that in. But anyway, and in this one, like it feels like a real prosthetic in that like, Oh, she has to weight it differently sometimes versus other times. It got hit one time and that actually almost made it break and she doesn't know how to trust it. Um, one time when she's having sex, she actually just takes it off because she just doesn't want it on. And so there, there is a sense that it is neither neither a curse nor a a a miracle, which is kind of what happens with disabilities is that everything is either shoved into like, oh, aren't they so inspirational? They're, they're, you know, miracles or, oh, I'm so sad for them. And it's like, and that often is kind of done with prosthetics, but it's like, no, this is just a thing she lives with. It makes it feel real, which makes it feel less like um, a symbol 
Um, and I think that's something that often isn't dealt with. Um, again, this book is really good with small details. There's a, a detail later where Elo is trying to prove that he's not a knight. And so he shows a guy his hand and it has no calluses because he hasn't used a sword in forever, except on the fingertips, which he uses for kneading dough. And I was like, oh, that is such a beautiful little detail of like, oh, this is like, a real world. Again, so much of writing I've found and, and you know, I've realized this a lot on the critique streams, which you should follow, uh, support independent journalism. Um, abstractness is like the death of writing. Like I, I always talk, uh, um, I mentioned several times that in A Song of Ice and Fire, take a shot. Martin follows the rule of threes a lot where he'll give three really quick details about something that are easily digestible and it makes you think that the world is very real. And so this author has a lot of those. And going back to the disability, that just makes it feel real. It's a thing she uses. It can be painful, like, like uh, it can rub, and she needs to put ointment on her, like her knee once she takes it off. Like, and there's so many things that make it feel like a thing she needs, and a thing she she relies upon, but also something that when she gets to take it off, she's like, ah, oh, yeah, baby. And and it was also nice. There's a moment where when she does take it off during sex, she asks the person she's having sex with on or off and he's like whatever is most comfortable for you and she's like off i felt like that was tipping the author the author was tipping her hand a little bit there. i don't know if for me it felt like an elo comment like that would be like he would not care yeah it does but it also felt very symbolic of like oh like so later there's a point where two of the people going to the on the pilgrimage who i loved it's a, a father and or not a father uh, it's a man and his wife um or a husband and wife and um they're going to deal with the fertility uh symbol uh that they have and they're like oh you guys want kids and they're like no she was marked with a fertility symbol when she was younger and there are no midwife gods around anymore so we're afraid she dies if she gets pregnant and like at one point he like literally tells her like it's your body it's your choice and i'm like okay all right can we cut like it's a little bit it's i get it it's good it's progressive but like it's tipping your hand a little bit and especially <laughs> because fertility and like childbirth and family planning was actually like a real thing that medieval people dealt with quite a lot um and so it would have been better i think to like make it a little more historical and a little less your body your choice but anyway though it's like that and all the lesbian moms and, and we're like the only two times i really saw the author's hand tipping um but again it's tipping in a good in a good social direction i just i don't like when i see the more author. lesbian moms <laughs> And so basically the Letho, her name is not Letho. What is the Yaro and Tele? It might have been Yatho. I don't know. It's it's I don't either know. the Yatho or Yaro. Yatho it's Yaro. One of those two. Yeah. And she is like a scribe or whatever at the library. And so they're like, okay, can you figure out what's going on with this god? And she goes and does research and comes back and is like, no, I can't. I don't know what's going I, on. I with got it. nothing. He he needs a shrine, but he doesn't have one. You'll probably need. And one of the things she does discover is that sometimes lesser gods who have lost a shrine can be taken under the wing of a, a different god who will let them use their shrine, and that's a way. And they were like, maybe if you find another god to take him under them, that'll that'll do it. And so they're like, we gotta go to Blen Raiden. And because uh, Kissin's like, I know a god who might know some shit <laughs> and might be able to help us. And they're like, okay, uh, we have to go to Blend Raiden to do this. And um, and she feels a bit guilty because they've done a lot, the three characters, to build themselves up as respectable members of the society. Um, and, and to build up their business specifically. And she's like, oh, I hate that I brought a god here. But anyway, they have to also go on the pilgrimage. Surprise! They're all going on the same pilgrimage! Um... And I have to describe a scene because it's going to come back later. Uh, Illagast, when he originally is going on the pilgrimage, he has to, he ends up finding a bar that people who still like gods go to called the Queen's Way. And the Queen was pro-gods, the previous queen. Um, and he meets this guy named Canavan. And um, Canavan is like, you want to go on a pilgrimage? Kind of suspicious of him, but then ends up calming down and being like, okay, you can go on the pilgrimage. This is my price, and it's an exorbitant price. Uh, but then he's like, this price, and it'll leave tomorrow, because he had been saying, uh, Illagast was like, I need to go as soon as possible. I don't want to wait a week, because um, he has a month <laughs> to do this at this point. At one point, Canavan touches him on the shoulder, and it kind of feels cold and a bit weird, and so he brushes his hand away. But Canavan's like, yep, you, you can go on the pilgrimage. Good luck. And then Yarrow also knows Canavan and had gone to him and asked if they could go on the pilgrimage. And when Yarrow and Tele drop them off 
on the pilgrimage, there's a moment where Canavan looks at uh, Inara and Kissin and goes, you didn't say one of them was a child. So he knew that uh, Kissin was a Vega and enough. And because like, nobody wants a Vega to go on the pilgrimage to the god <laughs> city when they're all going to ask the gods for favors. Like, why would we do that? So Inara and Kissin pretend that they are a ward and bodyguard and that she is a noble family's daughter who's going for a blessing and that Kissin is there to be her bodyguard. And thus starts the pilgrimage arc. And I'm not going to go into detail about a lot of this, except to say that a lot of the characters here are really lovely. That uh, the Tanner and the Shoemaker, who are husband and wife super cute the the husband's the one that makes the shit dumplings like the the filling's good but the outside is sticky and tacky and he doesn't know how to make it good and there's um this set of three women who have been friends their children have all left them um and two of them it seems like are a couple and the other one is just a friend and you learn what all of them are going to ask so like will said the one is asking for the fertility thing to be taken off because the god of midwives is gone now. Uh, and these old ladies are asking that they'd all like to die together because they're the only things they have. Their, ki- their kids are long gone. Nobody's there to support them. And they just like to be with each other. And that when one of them goes, they all go nicely in their sleep. And it's just such a sweet thing to ask for, mm-hmm. like for this group of friends. And the pilgrimage is just really fun. Yeah, I wish that the pilgrimage arc had lasted longer. Like I this agree. is when I felt like the book was really hitting its stride. I, was I like, agree. We got a cast of characters. This is going to be cool. We're gonna, you know, do a little bit of a Canterbury Tales type of a feeling. Um, I, I there was another Warhammer book I read forever ago when I was young that had a pilgrimage that I really liked, and it's a nice way of being able to flesh out the world. And it doesn't last super long because what happens is they keep getting attacked by these weird shadow wolf monsters, um, and it's weird and they don't know why because they're not gods, but they're summoned by a god and they don't know why they're getting attacked by them. So one thing, and I haven't talked about this because I didn't want to front load it, but here's probably an okay place to talk about it, is that I wish she had not called the gods gods because I kept thinking more of Abrahamic type gods and these really aren't that or Greek type gods. They're really just spirits like in the in the Japanese Shinto type sense. They're Shinto gods, but they're called gods. I know, but I kept being like, uh, but like belief would be really interesting to go into or like less of a spirit thing. Um, and that's an example of me just wanting something different from the book than what it's giving. And I and the the expectations being set a little bit differently. Like again, I think. I think naming it something slightly different would have been good. I like it. Okay, well, the thing is, and also the whole idea of the gods having left society and that making society a little bit different, I wish it had been explored more. It's explored a little bit, but I really wish it had been explored more in terms of like a spiritual ennui or like a sense of like, oh, we don't really have a purpose anymore. I think it would have been interesting to look at more of a belief, Abrahamic, um, Greek god type of a, a, a way of looking at religion and and gods going from the world and less of a shinto god where it's just like okay well now we don't have a fertility goddess this is kind of a pain um and i think that would have been a really interesting look at the world especially because what they see is that the king's portrait is all over the place a la mal stalin or mao type of a thing and so i would have really liked to see more of like oh the he is trying to make himself into the state god or, or not even necessarily a god but um the the state ethos and philosophy he's trying to replace it with which will come into play later in a way that's a little less nuanced than i would have liked i feel like these characters could have been a really good way of exploring more of that social ramifications of it and that's one thing is i would have liked more of the social ramifications but i think what happened is i think this author was cautious because we've both made the comment that for a first book, having a smaller cast of characters, you can do more right with them. And unfortunately, I think to look at the social aspect more and the ramifications of it and to have stay with the larger cast of characters would have been a bigger scope than the book is trying to go for. And I think it was a cautious move. I think you're right. I think that could have made it better. And again, it's one of those things which keeps it from getting to the crisp level. But I think for a first time move, it might have ended up being a bit more than they could chew. I think that's true. And I think also the thing about it is the more characters, the longer the book gets. Um, because this book doesn't have a lot of fat. This isn't like, we're going to just keep talking about it, Akawar, where like a lot of scenes can just get cut and the book isn't hurt. So for when she doesn't do something, it's like, this is not 
a time constraint. Um, like Sabriel, for example, or um, the Scorpio races are both very tight books where you can't really cut anything. And this book is like that. So if you're going to add more characters into it, like then the book becomes longer and the pace changes. Um, and so I could see it's it's kind of a give and take. But um, yeah, that was, that's it's not even necessarily a criticism per se, but it is something that I would have done differently. But it's a way that it could have been better. Because again, I think the social aspect about what does, what does society look like post gods what is missing what is better like ha have populations increased because people aren't getting sacrificed have things normalized where it's not whether god's making decisions it is just whim of the like, like one of those things sometimes you see when um uh, and I'm going to use Princess Mononoke as an example where when the forest god dies, it doesn't mean the forest dies. It just that that instead of having an embodiment of personification, it just goes back to being a force of nature. Is that what happened with some of them? When one of the gods died, you know, uh, did all of a sudden they go back to very clannish roots? Like one of the things about Islam was that it was the idea that um every, all, all brothers are equal. We are all brothers under the sky type of a thing to break through some tribalism. So maybe once they lose a god that unifies a bunch of tribes that way, do they suddenly go back to clannishness do they go back to like that would be a really interesting look at it i think and that's why i say that it's it's a fair comment because it would have been really interesting but i you're right it's not a criticism but it's a way it could have been even better but it, again i think the like unfortunately because the scope is so tight she told a succinct story for the most part we're just seeing strengths and it perhaps had more been added and it had it been longer more weaknesses would have showed and so i think it might have just been a strategic decision to just keep it tight well the thing is i don't think she was interested in the belief side of gods i think she was interested in the kami kami how do you pronounce that kami, kami spirits type gods which it's fine uh, again, like like I like we were both just saying, it's fine. And I I like the Shinto. I was actually really relieved that that's what it was because I find that a very like because I've studied a lot of uh, Asian belief systems slash uh, moral systems. It was really nice to see a Western fantasy setting, but with a uh, Eastern god system in place like i love that i found it very refreshing and for me that is a kind of system i respond well to as a reader like i like that better than anytime there's like a one god or just like there's three and they're like i i'm, I'm like oh it feels a little too <laughs> close to home like uh that the one uh uh second world uh fantasy that had that is based on like hispanic or and spanish culture that i was telling you about they have a god and a religion that's not christianity but it feels kind of close <laughs> <laughs> and i i it makes me i'm like i kind of want christianity my fantasy um and it's not but it just gets too close and so for me i really enjoyed this but you're right that would have been fascinating look at us not pistoling just discussing <laughs> potentials uh, we're such a so so smart so nuanced it helps that the book is really good if the book was bad a lot of these problems would be more severe <laughs> uh, that's kind of the thing is like the book does succeed at what it's trying to do so it doesn't need to be so like so like three parts dead for example was also trying to talk about gods a lot and it was trying to do more of the belief thing but i think it actually didn't do it any better than this it did not it's a pretty good book in its own right but because it was a little less simple and you could tell that it wanted to do those things a little bit more than this book did the the loss of them felt more noticeable i think this is a better book than three parts dead honestly because it's for and and for me as a reader it's much tighter the scope mm -hmm. is solid definitely like it's and and three parts dead was it had it was great world building interesting concepts but a little messy in some of its parts it's still a decent book enjoyed but it for me this would trump it anyway continuing pilgrimage part great wish it had been longer uh they keep getting they get attacked one night one guy dies. Very sad. He was a harpist. It's a character that had just been introduced and like you were getting to know and then just cut. And I, I like the starkness of that. Um, and then uh, they continue on. Four nights later, they get attacked again, but this time by two shadow things. And Kissin is starting, because she deals with gods a lot, starting to put together like, ah, this is probably a pattern. We're probably going to get attacked again by more in four nights. Um, but during the attack with the two the party ends up getting separated where uh, they're getting attacked. Kissin and uh, Ilagast are trying to, and 
Inara and uh, Kissin have fake names. Ina and Tethys. They were at a point where the pilgrimage the next morning was supposed to get on a boat and go across, go down the river. And during the fight, as night comes, they need, they're just like, get on the, it doesn't like water. It is not uh, good with water. So if you get on the river, you'll be able to escape it. But Inara refuses to leave. Um, and Inara has been hiding something that we haven't mentioned, which is she can see colors that reflect human emotion, which is something gods can do. And this is something Skeddy can do. So you're like, ah, she gets this from Skeddy. There are limitations Skeddy has on his powers because of Inara. She's probably got this here. Um, but you also like very quickly start to go like, Nobody knows who Inara's papa is. There's a lot of gods. They end up getting separated from the rest of the pilgrim party. It's literally just Elo, Kissin, uh, Inara, and Skeddy. And Skeddy is like, come. he was trying to help Inara. And so he like popped out where he's been hiding this whole time. So nobody would know there was a god hanging on to a girl. Um, and so then we start the Elagast Kissin uh, Inara portion of the story where they're getting to know each other. They're beginning to become more honest. And there is a, some tension because Kissin and Elo don't really know who each other are. He knows she's a Vega. And he's like, why the fuck is a Vega going to the city of the gods? Like, I don't trust you. And why do you have a young girl? And then she's like, why is a knight? Because she recognizes him as a knight. She's like, why are you... And you're fucking dumb King Aaron. Because despite being a vegan and killing <laughs> gods, she doesn't like the king. She doesn't like, like, she's like, fuck the power. <laughs> well, the other thing, too, is that they've been kind of bullied by knights on the way here. And you find in, in like, the, the vibe is that, like, eh, he's a good king. But, like, a lot of the stuff that's happening in the realm is not good. Um, but it's also important to note that a lot of this is being filtered through Elo's point of view. And he is super in love with the king and, like, thinks he's great. So... That will come into play later. Also, one of the things is that uh, you, what you learn about Kissin is despite the fact that she's a Vega and a god killer, she just, like, if it's a little tiny god just minding its business, she doesn't fuck with it. And she doesn't, like, if she finds people who worship gods, she doesn't fuck with them, as long as it is not a danger. And if she hasn't been hired to do it, it's not her business. And so she's not antagonistic versus the knights who are. If they find you have been honoring a god you fucked like you done and that's not her despite her massive dislike for gods and the things gods ask for in exchange and so you see this difference between a god literal god killer and the knights and it, it creates a bit of a starkness between them um and what Aaron has put into place in society they end up in a city that is kind of like built over a waterfall it's kind of like almost like a bunch of bridges i liked it i wish it would have been it's like the bridge city i think it's called actually or yeah. something like that and it was really interesting but while they're here we begin to see kind of the extent of Skeddy's power where there's this, they have to go into a tavern and an inn. And uh, one of the things Skeddy can do, and he's been doing this whole time is if there's people and he doesn't want them to be seen, he'll be like, you can't see us. We're not here. You don't notice us. And he can push his will onto people and make them believe what believe white lies. A lot of the time it's to comfort people. Like, don't worry about it. Like you're not hurt. You'll be fine. Like, and he can calm people down, but he can also just like protect them through this. But they end up having to lie. And it's so funny because Elo's like, uh, and Inara like, we have to lie to get ourselves in here. They can't know. And Kissin's like, hi, I'm Kissin the Vega. I know the guy who owns this place. <laughs> and they were like, why didn't you tell us now? Because Inara's pretending she's a palm reader. And uh, uh, Ilagas is pretending he's a singer. And uh, and now she's like, no, nah, I'm just kissing, just vibing. Um, <laughs> and, and it's funny because she's a little shit. Like Kissin is like... Mm -hmm grumpy and shitty sometimes and this is one of those moments and because he also took like he knows who Elagast is that he was the commander of King Aaron's forces during the battles of Glen Raiden and she takes them to a veterans bar where it's all just people who fought in the battle of Glen Raiden and Elagast is like fuck you you did this on purpose um but anyway, during the scene, uh, someone asks Inara to read his palm, and uh, Skeddy uses his god power to do it through Inara's body, and he's never done this before, and Inara's never had it, but she's happy in this moment because she doesn't want to have to do it, let him kind of take control. But Skeddy does not like Kissin. Kissin doesn't like Skeddy. I again, she's a god killer. This is a little god attached to a little girl, and she calls him Parasite a lot, and so he's like, I don't like her this night. This knight is good. We should work with this knight. And so he ends up taking control of Inara's voice 
to make her say, because Inara likes Kissin. Kissin has been teaching her how to do stuff. She's learning. She's kind of begrudgingly, like, really happy. There's one point where Kissin's like, ah, you know, we, and she's like, don't, you promised you wouldn't leave me. Um, and so you can tell that there is a fondness growing between them. But Oh, Scatacath, he don't like this. So he takes over Inara and basically says, help me. I don't want to travel with the Vega anymore. I'm scared for my life. Help me, Sir Knight. And then he starts laying onto the Knight. So he's he's taking control of Inara. And then he uses more of his power to put lies into uh, Elo's head. Like, Kissin's dangerous. The Vega's dangerous. I can't leave this girl. And so he starts controlling both of them. And he controls Inara enough that she is not in control of herself. Yeah, he can feel her like bucking against his control and trying to get away from it. And he's like, no, we just got to do it. And like, because the thing is, he's gotten a little drunk on power at this point. Like he's like, and also he thinks about like, ooh, somebody could just like worship me a little bit. Like, you know, just give me a token here or there or, you know, put something on a shrine if I had one. Like he's really beginning to get into this whole God thing. And it's it's really great because like the guy who wants the palm reading offers like a coin and he's like, my first offer. And it's just, <laughs> yeah, really he's funny. into it. And he's also like, he's like, also like, this is for Ina. This is for both of us. Like, I'm doing this for us. She'll understand. Um, but, and then they end up sleeping. And the next morning she like, he, through, um, Skedekath uses Inara and they sneak away. And again, Inara is not in control. And they find, uh, Elo and they're like, please take us. And Inara is crying because she does not have control of herself and she doesn't like this. And Skeddy's like, no, it's okay. Don't worry. But also like, why did I ever make a promise not to do this? This is so useful. <laughs> I can be so useful. I can be in control. I can have power. And he's like getting real drunk and it's really like hitting a fever pitch. And Inara is like not happy with this. And he starts weaving Elo. So the, the two of them run off and they go out and Kissin is like already out of the gate waiting for them. Like, hi guys, took you long enough. <laughs> and I'm just like, you, you crafty bitch, you. But anyway, and the two of them end up having a duel because in a, through Inara's voice, Skatakath is like, I don't want to travel with you anymore, Kissin. Uh, and Kissin is like, no, I made a promise. I'm not abandoning you. I'm coming with you, but you're not going without me. And so Elo's like, I gotta do this for honor. And so they have a duel and like Elo thinks that he's gonna like route the uh, Vega. It's bullshit that he doesn't. He I'm hasn't sorry. held a sword in 10 years. But the book doesn't really make a point of that. He doesn't like ever point out that like, oh, his hand, he's had to fight so much his hand has begun to blister or something like that. That I wish they did do, but he does say like, it's been a minute. And I, the thing is, yeah, she fights gods. I'm absolutely sure she can take a knight. And how she does it is she realizes that sword to sword, she'd lose. So she throws those to the side and she hands to hand. A sword is terrible with close range weapons. And that's how she routes him. And she's just, she's a fucking beast. He's been baking for years. Yeah, but that's not how sword fighting works. It's not like, oh, it's like saying like, oh, he has an assault rifle. and I can't match him with assault rifle. I'll get a pistol from the 19th century. And it's like, no, that's not how fighting works. Anyway, whatever. I'm not. I'm a little bit salty about it. But what's really funny about it is after this point, she likes Elo so much more. And it's really funny that like fighting was what it took. And he he likes her more. He's like, damn, she good. Like she very good. And like they're so impressed with each other as warriors. It's great. But anyway, in the middle of this, there's a point where one of them is gonna. I think uh, Kissin is about to stab Elo, and Inara just screams, "Stop!" And it bashes. Skedekath's power away just knocks him and immediately takes off the claws that Skedekath had in Elo's mind causing him to do all that stuff he kind of clears and is confused and Inara has like literally just broken the bounds of a god and you're like oh this bitch half god um like she she's the, her power is not Skeddy's power Th that's not how this is working what you find out is Kissin knew that Skedekath was fucking around was trying to like get them free of this and Inara is so pissed at Skeddy and like for obvious reasons that was not good one of the things I like about this book is it doesn't just like nobody's all good or all bad I was gonna say I really like the way that Skeddy is sort of thinks in an alien way to humans in that he he does feel like not a human. I would have liked if the book had pushed that even farther. But again, it's in a comfortable range where you're like, oh, he does think differently because we get his viewpoint at several points where in a lot of the books we've read, it's literally just felt like a person like or 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 like a person with like a vague 
accent in their mind, so to speak. Whereas here, you, you do get a sense that like he doesn't quite understand morality or people. And it, uh, and I thought that was interesting. Again, I wish it had been pushed a little bit farther, but it, it was a really nice touch. The other part I like is towards the end when Inara is freaked out by the city and he's like, you don't have to be scared. It's just like, and it, there's this moment where he's like, oh no, these are just like... There's nothing. And she's like, there is literal death. There was a massacre. There is history. And he's like, oh, no, that don't worry. That was it happened. It's like that shortness of God's memories mm -hmm. in some way. Like the, there's that length. But because of their length, they, they can't they don't attach to fine details and the value of like individual human lives. And there was a moment it, like towards the end where he did feel really alien. But I, I will say I agree. I wish there had been more of that towards the later half of the book, because this was amazing. I loved it. And I love how Skeddy has to like reacquaint himself with Inara and they have to figure out mm -hmm. who they are. Well, and there's a real impact to it, which in a lot of the books we've read, something emotional will happen and then the characters kind of just go back to how they were before and it doesn't feel realistic. There's a point where they rebond, but it, it's different. Like their their relationship to each other is different. Like they, they've healed, but there is, it's not what it was, which I really like. It works really well. After that, they end up just traveling. Everybody's pissed off at Skeddy, but they end up getting tacked again, but this time by four of the Shadow Beasts. Skeddy saves Anara's life and puts himself in danger, which is not a thing gods normally do for humans. So that shows Kiss and like, oh no, he does love. Like I've never seen a god put himself in danger for a human without getting something in return. Um, And she's like, oh no, he does, he does like Anara. Like he does genuinely care for her. Um. And then we enter the part of the book where, like, Kissin and Elo have the entire time noticed things about each other. Like, like, there's there's been a point where, like, uh, Elo was like, "Wow, that's a really fascinating looking woman." And then, like, there's a point where someone says something about her being ugly, and she's like, "Yeah, I'll take it." And then, um, someone's <laughs> like, "She's not ugly," or in ours, like, "She's not ugly, right, Elo?" And then Elo's like, doesn't say anything, but you're <laughs> like, he's like, she's deaf, not ugly. One of the other touches I really liked is that early in the, for like half the book, I didn't think there was going to be a romance because I thought she was just straight lesbian, so to speak. Um, and so I was like, man, it's really cool to get a book where like the characters are growing relationships, but it's not in a romantic way. Um, and like, that's not really how it plays out, but it, it did give a sense of realism to their dynamic that I don't think would necessarily be there if from right from the beginning you knew that they were making eyes at each other. And it's not like like to use Fourth Wing and Akawar, uh or Akatar, Akamath. They're not like, like every time Elo appears, Kissin's not like, God damn! Look at his <laughs> backs touch. and his eyes glittered or his jawline that cut through bone. You know, like it, it's not doing that. He just appears. And a lot of the times for both of them, when it's in their points of view, it's not talking about the other character in terms of how good looking they think they are. And most of the time where you get Elo thinking that Kissin is attractive, you're seeing it from Inara's point of view and just him like staring at her. And it's really cute because he's not like it's neither like they're not slabs of yummy meat to each other. They're, they're people first. And the attraction is coming out like second. There's a really nice scene when they're at like a, a uh, Elo gets injured. They have to save him, but they end up taking a, a like uh, she has to help heal him. Uh, Kissin does. And they end up taking like a bath in the river. And um, it's also one of the scenes where she was like, well, if he was going to look that good topless, she was going to look. She'd enjoy it. She, <laughs> it may have been a rough journey. She'd enjoy what she could. And I was like, I love that. Like, it's just such a nice way to be like, Elo's hot shirtless. And it, it fits with Kissin's character where it wouldn't with some of the others that we've read. Here she's like, she's kind of crass like that. Like it's, it's a nice thing. And what she realizes is that there is a mark on Elo that he hadn't realized um, and like a scar type of thing was hiding and that's um something we haven't talked about but when a god curses you it shows up as like a tattoo essentially curses or gifts you slash blesses you it's marked on your body he didn't realize it was there though he's like what because he couldn't see it and what they remember is that calvan had touched him there so he had set on some kind of a curse onto him for the shadow dogs to get him I don't remember why. I think it's because it was a curse he had or... Canavan was working with that god of transfers. And there was, so there's a whole... Oh, right. It's the Rebellion. Canavan is one of the rulers, uh, rulers of the Rebellion. He recognized who Elo was and knew what was like... It, they know the plot that the king is trying to do by turning himself into 
the thing. Um, and so he was, he's, he's like, I need to stop this guy from going to Blend Raided. And so I'm going to curse him and sacrifice an entire pilgrim party to do so. And that's why he was upset that there was a child there. Cause he was like, I don't care if a Vega gets killed in the bargain. But then when the child uh, appears. And so what you realize is that there are God, like that gods are working closer with human than, than they have previously, because he should not have been able to do that to Elo based on what they know of current relationships between humans and gods. Um, and obviously the God is working, is staying close enough with Canavan to help this happen. But anyway, there's also the idea like throughout the entire thing of what were the Kreas fighting for King Aaron or against King Aaron? It, why were they killed? It's because it, she realizes because she sees the symbol that was um, the god that cursed uh, Elagast. That symbol she had seen on letters her mother had been writing, and she always smelt lemon in her mother's room. And what Elagast tells them is that writing in lemon juice, once you put a flame underneath it, you can see it where you didn't see it before. And so her mom was hiding things and was either involved thwarting this rebellious god or helping this rebellious god and she doesn't know something we forgot to mention that's actually kind of big is that the reason Elagas was so emo is that he really loved Aaron um but he didn't know that Aaron was going to betray, betray all of the gods that had fought alongside them to create like no gods and so that was a decision that he just couldn't stomach and so he went off to be like a baker hermit after that because his like his mothers had had gods and had a positive relationships and he was like yo because the, the idea was originally in the war the old gods because the and this is some backstory that is actually really nice the idea is there are the new gods were getting taken in by societies more they were offering things more concrete that humans wanted wealth success protection versus the old gods that were a bit more mercurial and like nature gods you know and the old gods did not like the humans partnering with the new gods and so a war started with between old gods and new gods themselves but then it sucked in humanity and so Aaron's like people had originally been fighting with a set of gods against these other ones and then when Aaron came to power he was like Fuck the, the gods that helped us, fuck them. Because he had fought with this god of war who was represented by a stag head. And after they became uh, rulers, he, he killed that god of war. They literally slaughtered that god of war in the gods. Like, uh, he had a big, like, plaza. And um, Elagas was like, that's my line. <laughs> that is my line. That was, you literally betrayed the gods that fought for and with us. And that's like, you're denying people what they like, would like. Um, and it's interesting because that for him was a harder thing to swallow than what Vegas do. Because Vegas, they target problematic gods. And again, Kissin leaves gods that are not doing problems. She leaves them alone. She don't give a shit. Uh, Kissin also, she doesn't kill people. <laughs> it comes up multiple times. So she's like, I don't kill humans. Um which has uh, gets Elo a nice line later. They get to Glen Raven eventually. Um, they have kind of bonded by this point. And like the other thing is that this book has very kind of clear arcs, which sounds like a basic thing that you hear in um, writing class a lot. But like a lot of the authors we've read don't seem to be able to do clear character arcs or relationship arcs. And so by this point, they're like, oh, it feels cute because they're like they're they've gotten over their surliness with each other and they're on like better footing um, and they have to leave behind legs, which is the horse that Kissin has, which is sad because because it's a horse. And and Inara and the horse has have been getting real close and it's and, and Kissin loves her horse that she named legs because it has like three more than her, which is just like <laughs> a very funny thing. Um, <laughs> and so they get into Glen Raven. Glen Raven is creepy. Um, it's not as creepy as it could be, but it's like, it's nicely atmospheric. There are all these gods begging basically for anyone to pay attention to them. And you get the sense that there's like shadows there and it's like haunted because there's like, there's knights who are supposed to not let anybody in, but then there's a bunch, then there's like a whole little pilgrim group that, um, li like makes their way there because they can just bribe their way in. It's really interesting. Cause like this whole time pilgrims have been persecuted, but once they actually get into the city of Glen Raiden, the King's guards are just letting them in and Ilagast is a bigger problem because he's not a pilgrim and why are you here um and it, 
they quickly run into uh, an, uh, someone who is now a knight, but was one of Elagast's squires and one of the people Elagast trained. It was after the initial part of the war when they had to start training some commoners. And so uh, the guy was like, you abandoned us. You told us, um, like, my life, my heart, my... Is someone dying in the background? Kalia's downstairs laughing very hard. Let me close my door. Yeah, so he ends up having this tussle. He knocks the guy out they tie him up and they go in and their first stop uh is to see this water god that the one that kissin had been talking about named on and on is described fantastically she's like (laughs) a voluptuous rubenesque water goddess who's just so old she doesn't give a shit like she is uninvolved because the thing is she's super powerful because she's a river um and the thing about it is that all of the water gods gossip with each other because they all run to the sea and they're all the you know they start in the sky they go to the ground yeah all water runs to the ocean and so like she can she kind of like knows more stuff like she knows about um a citizen's uh thing with uh kissin and then also kissin has like a blessing from her of like a little bit of water she got from her old bounty hunter um uh not actually bounty hunter god killer um like master which she apprenticed to and it's kind of it's a cool scene because the god like they need to give something for her to give them the advice or the knowledge that they seek and so one of the things she takes from elogas that i liked later is that he had um the king's old sigil which was a lion on his sword and it's not the sword that was important to him it was the lion sigil and so that's what she takes and it's like a delicious like thing like an imbuement of it that she can kind of Like a parasitical thing, and I really liked that. This is also when I'm going to talk about how I like how this book is never like, (gasps) Sacre bleu! Inara's half god. It what just keeps happening because it's there's never it. What just keeps happening is people like gods look at her and go, "You're weird." (laughs) <laughs> where did you get made weird creature what it, it, on is originally just like what are you and you're like oh she's a half guard a god and they're like we've never seen one of those before what the fuck is this um because it never the book never goes in ours in ours daddy's a god it never does that there's just another Mm -hmm. point where another god just goes fuck off halfling and it's just so nice because so many times plot twists in books are supposed to be these like shocking revelations that are just like (gasps) hold the phone stop everything this is going to change how you think about this character and you'd already come to this conclusion so it just feels like the book naturally affirming like yeah this is what's happening um and it's not like taking away from the other stuff that's happening that's more important at that time but anyway uh, Inara makes uh, a trade with the god, which is just the god wants one of her hairs so she can contact her anytime she wants. And Inara gets one of her, the god's hairs so she can contact on anytime. Because, like, Kissin has to come all the way here to talk to this mm-hmm. god. And now Inara is just going to have this hair where she can contact her anytime she wants, which is, like, a fantastic... Like, that on its own was worth <laughs> some stuff, I feel. But anyway, um, and basically what the god tells them in Skedeketh is that, like, uh, your shrine got destroyed and another god tied you to this family and you you, the only way you're gonna figure this out is if you remember who you were prior to this and he's like i don't remember anything and she's like that's not my problem sucks to suck (laughs) advice given sir (laughs) (laughs) i loved it because it was just like it's gonna get it's like that's just not helpful i don't know what to do with that elo is like hey you guys gotta leave um and so basically he Skeddy spies on him when he's talking to An, um, and it's funny because Skeddy doesn't understand. There's a mix-up that happens next that makes a lot of sense because Skeddy's a god, um, and it, it helps that it's also a mix-up plot that resolves very quickly and is, doesn't cause angst for half the book. Um, but basically, what An tells him is that hey, the heart is was given freely to Aaron, and. So it's being taken away freely. It was by a hearth goddess and you need to find another fire god to replace it. And he's like, okay, cool. But what are they going to pay? Like, what do I have to pay? And she's like, a life. Or like, you like you know, sacrifice. God's, and Skeddy's like- Gods love martyrs. And so Skeddy's like, oh no, he's going to sacrifice either Anara or Kissin. I got to get them away. And so there's like a whole chapter where he's trying to subtly get them away from Elo, which is just very funny because it's like, it's very clear to the reader that Elo is going to sacrifice himself. Absolutely. And like he eventually, Skeddy tells Kissin because like Kissin and him have gotten to a point where they like each other. And like Kissin's mm-hmm. like, ah, I can't imagine killing him. And, and he's like, 
I would rather I, I I'm relying I can can't see Inara without the Vega and I like Inara uh, and so it's super cute because it, like the growth for these characters is just adorable an arc there is an arc here all of them Inara goes from being like poor sheltered girl to like yeah like oh I have control of my own destiny and it doesn't quite matter what my mom thought I'm the head now do we think our mom's actually dead by the way no right oh I think mom is dead I think oh, really? Re- yeah, I think she's going to reconnect with her father. I think her father is alive. I think that's the artwork. Oh, okay, I thought story. for sure her mom, because like we don't see a body and in fiction, if you don't see a body, you're like... Oh. I mean, that's true, but I genuinely think her mom's dead. Like, I, I don't know why. That's just, that's just my Because, opinion. yeah, there is a parent to talk to. In fiction, you have one parent, and then th- you lose them, and then you get the one that's been missing the whole time. Like, there's Yeah, always- that's true. It's, it's literally a thing that little third grade Maria, when I was writing a book about uh, a dragon school... Back before it was cool, guys. Before Fourth Wall. And yet, weirdly enough, still better than Fourth Wall. I'm Honestly, positive having not read any of it. A hundred percent better. <laughs> but one of the things I did was I was going to have my main, like, she'd grown up with her father, her mother had been, and then she was going to get her mother and her father was going to die tragically. Um, and so it was going to be the trade. And like, that was third grade Maria being like, ah, yes. Ooh, the angst. <laughs> <laughs> It's just it's just something that happens in fiction a lot. You lose one to gain the other. Kissin gets upset at first, not because she thinks it, because at first she's like, hey, there's a moment where you think maybe she doesn't understand, but she quickly puts it together that he's going to sacrifice himself. Um, but she is just upset that he's considering sacrifice at all. And this is where it comes out where she was like, I was a sacrifice. I somebody had chosen to sacrifice me and my entire family, and I had to get out of there. And so you can't fucking do this. And then she realizes, oh, he's gonna sacrifice him, fuck his fucking self. And then she's like, no, I'm not gonna let you do that at all. Fuck you. You don't get to make that choice for somebody else. And she's like, I'm sure Aaron would not want you to do this. I when my dad did it for me, I did not want him to do this. And he was like, it's what I gotta do. They end up having like a nice moment. They has the sexes. Not a painful sex scene. A little too specific with body language, but not painful, which is again, rare. And a nice cut to black. Exactly, at an opportune time, uh, yep. it, which, you know, it's judicious and I liked that. And it's funny because the next night, or the next morning she wakes up and Elo isn't there. And she looks at Skeddy and is like, what the fuck, where'd he go? And No, 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 okay. It, I remember the part with Skeddy that's funny. And she asks Skeddy where he goes and Skeddy's like, oh, he went over wherever. And then they figure out that Skeddy is lying. And he's like, yeah, he gave me a coin. Yeah, like, of course I'm going to lie. A freely offered token? I am a god of white <laughs> lies. What were you expecting? You were expecting me to say no to an offering? You don't know me. And it's just, it's hysterical because he's a god. He yeah. thrives <laughs> on offerings. And Elo, you know Elo must have been like, god, like here you go, Skeddy. Here's an offering. And and not just not just to lie, but to make his footsteps softer so they can like it's just, mwah, I love it. And he's like, and I thought he was going off for something. You guys clearly got along fine. I thought it was a white lie, because that's uh, two things. One, I don't love how well defined the gods are in terms of like a white lies god. Like that's such a specific cultural concept. I would have liked it a little more soft magic, but again, it's fine. Um the other thing is that I kind of wish the gods were a little bit more Naomi Novik uh, a la Spinning Silver where like because you said a thing in the fairy realm it became like physics itself shifted um, where they, they have their physics are based off of metaphor where ours are literal no kind of anyway but I would have liked that where it's like once they make a pact like the gods can't unmake it they can't do anything whereas here it just felt more like uh, it, it felt a little more magic-y than, than reality shifting um but again, with so much with this book, it was fine. It really does. Like, in the moment, like, if you think about it, yeah. And again, it's a way to improve it, but it worked well enough in the book itself. So they immediately start going after him because fuck him. He goes and he finds a fire god, and the fire god he finds is the fire god that her family was sacrificed <laughs> to. And well, he's- what's hilarious is he doesn't know what she was called, so he was like... Maybe is this the one that her family sacrificed to? She would be really pissed if she knew about that. <laughs> <It is. Yeah. laughs> and so he summons her and she's like, oh, you, I knew you'd come. And immediately I'm like, abort, abort my son, <laughs> my brother in Christ, abort <laughs> mission. And so he makes he makes the bargain and he's like, I will give you my God, my heart if you replace the heart of. Uh, and, and the thing is, like, Hestia, Hestia knows too much. She's like, oh, you want you want to save your king's heart? It's dying. And she's he's like, yeah, I'll, I'll give up mine. And she's like, delicious. The, a broken heart is worth more. And then immediately, uh, a little 
another fire god pops up, except it looks like Aaron. And what you discover is Hesia, or no, the other, the, the hearth god who originally made the deal wasn't taking anything away. He was fine. They were putting on a show because they want... In, the, in that initial bargain, that god tied itself to Aaron. So now that was like a baby god king. But to me, take it even further and get even more power, they wanted to bind Hesia to Aaron so that they would become a god. They would, they would transcend just godhood and just kinghood and be like the unifying force uh, of a thing. So we get two cackling villains for the price of one. We do, and I couldn't love this. The book did such oh, a good job. Yeah. I don't mind it from the goddess, because I, I get why she's doing it, but I hate it from Aaron. Because he also really does just turn into like a cackling villain, and he's like, yeah, no, and it's clever because you are this whole time, you were assuming that like Aaron and Kissin just had different views of the kingdom, but it's like, oh no, Aaron was just kind of like filtering our perception of the king as a good person through a lot of the actions that we see aren't good um and you know he hasn't seen the king in 10 years like yeah he doesn't know what's up he's been on his own and so like conceptually i think it's a good twist but aaron's actual thing is like to like final fantasy see i want to become a god not like i see the ennui in my people and i i want to replace it with myself they need me or my rationality or even like you know um you are my brother, and it was a difficult decision to make, but I know this is the decision you would have made. Kind of a, a thing, like, I just cut out the middleman. That's what I was looking for, honestly, out of it. Because he does immediately just become a cackling villain. Because the god was like, you are the last thing Aaron loves. And I'm like, I don't feel that right now. Aaron is real smug about all of this. He's real self-satisfied. I, like, if he'd been crying in a corner, like, what have I done? But, like, I thought it was... And the thing is, I love that idea, Will, that he realized he had fucked his people and that there was a general sense of ennui and that he was like, I got this wrong people do need something to believe in. I still don't trust most of the gods because they can take and they can abuse their power, but I know that I wouldn't do that. And then that slow descent into bite, like originally just agreeing, like, and then I reached out to Hesia or to the hearth goddess and she agreed to bond to me more uh, in exchange for getting some of the benefit of the people that like, blessed me and stuff like that and then she came to me about Hesse and I I saw the path forward to avoid the civil war and this is for the good of the people and like it, you know I had to make the ultimate sacrifice like that and he would have just been more like a normal version of like oh no uh, we were friends and I and I trusted you and you left me and this is just what I had to do to get along uh Maria Katie is in here so you gotta take a shot because we're talking mm -hmm. about a song of ice and fire again my water bottle's yeah. not here but <laughs> oh, you got to do the, oh, that was painful to drink, though. <laughs> <coughs> one of the things that is really uh, one of the deconstructive tropes that uh, Martin talks about in the first book is that the king, Robert, he was like a really virile, strong man. And he was a great revolutionary, but he was not a great king. He was a great man of action, but he was not a great ruler. Um, and so that actually also could have been played into here in that Aaron was the the, the leader they needed in that moment to get through the war, but like actually ruling is hard and he wasn't set up for it. And you know, that could have been something too, where he was like, you know, I needed you to help rule and you, you left, you left me, me. And I, you know, and, 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 um, Elo could realize that like, yeah, that, you know, he, people are good in some moments and not in others. And they're good at some things and not in others. And just having a monarch who's both general and administrator is not a great form of government. That's really the biggest weakness for me with this book is that Aaron mm -hmm. just becomes cackling evil guy. And I wanted, and because the thing is, it felt like, uh, take a shot. Oh, I'm at taking the, a shot. Yes. At the end of the Game of Thrones TV show. When Daenerys just goes terrible baddie. Grand Theft Dragon. And then Jon Snow has to kill her. Um, it it doesn't feel earned because we, number one, they didn't feel close enough for this to feel really impactful. But number two, like, she just went insane all of a sudden. And you're like, what the fuck <laughs> happened? This, she's too evil. <laughs> for it to really feel what they were going for, which was that, like, ache of sadness. And the thing is, what makes me upset with this, legitimately, is that Aaron and Elo had the relationship to make for that bittersweet, angsty mm -hmm. ennui. What I would have preferred, because, like, what I would have preferred is for them to escape and then 
him to like simultaneously like want to save him but know he has to kill him but for it to be painful because and 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 that like on both sides like he said that he betrayed him he said that he did this and for it to feel like these are two brothers that are going to have to try kill them like and and it's mm-hmm. going to be and and it just because he just becomes cackling villain and there's like a hint that maybe he's being influenced by the fire god because he sees some of the old aaron in there and i'm like god no let's not do that whole like cheap thing where we try to make it a corrupting the ring at the last minute kissin shows up and is like i got all my god killing stuff i hate this bitch inara shows up first and is like oh, okay. stop and cuts through uh oh right has he has power and and then she's like what are you little halfling um and then kissin shows up and is like brittite powder brittite blade fucking hell and then she's like you guys have to run get the fuck out of here elo you take because uh the goddess starts trying to take elo's heart at first uh but then this whole thing happens uh and uh kissin uses the vial of the the token she had from the goddess on to save uh elo and is like you guys need to get out of there you can't fight i will buy you time and he's like um you literally told me not to sacrifice myself in, for someone else and now you're doing it and she goes no no, no. this ain't sacrifice this is revenge, baby. Basically confirming that, yeah, this is the goddess that fucked up her family, who you find out she spent years trying to get. But, like, the goddess wouldn't appear because there was just murder in her heart. <laughs> the goddess yeah. is like, I ain't showing up for you, little witch. Um, and so she, like, tangles with this goddess. This is another thing where I don't love this ending. Because there's a thing where at the, when the goddess's power first blows out, like... Um, Inara feels the flames that killed her family and it's like, oh shit, this is like an emotional power that the god has. And I would have liked if this whole fight had been framed with Kissin having to fight through her trauma and being that little girl yes. in a burning building again. I and instead, it's just like Marvel action scene. And like I feel like it could have been so much more thematic and Sabriel-esque in its uh, emotional um impact i completely agree as an action sequence it's fine it's very functional but what she ends up doing is she grabs her because she has these bright gloves and drags her off the cliff and into the ocean and then calls Ocidian, who again has had a has been harboring a problem and what you find out is the village that she's from after uh they burnt her family Ocidian dragged it into the ocean as punishment for going to that other goddess and killing his loved ones um and so, like, nobody won. <laughs> like, they burnt her family, <laughs> and they still got fucked. Um, and uh, she calls Ocidian, and Ocidian comes and just rips apart the fire goddess. Uh, and then Kissin's dying, and she's like, God, I, I'm i just, I'm not gonna, again, I'm not gonna use my dad's thing, I'm gonna die. And then she's like, wait a minute. Well, and the funny thing is, Ocidian, too, is like, do you want to use it? Because he doesn't like having an open um, tab, essentially. And she's like, fuck you. And then she realizes, she's sitting there and she's like, I was so pissed off at my dad for not saving himself and being like, like I would have rather he had been there for me. I'm not going to make Inara go through that same thing. And the book just ends with her crying out, Ocidian. And you're like, oh, she's using it. She's going to survive. The, gr- the gang's going to be back together. And like, listen, the ending is definitely the weakest part. The whole cackling uh, Aaron the lack of the depth from the final confrontation between her and Hesia. Like, again, I think Will's right. I think framing it in terms of her trauma regarding fire and the burning of her family would have been incredible for her to have to fight through that. And I would have liked if it had been in half mental, half practical as a fight. Uh, but at, overall, it's just a solid book. I enjoyed the fuck out of it. It was great. Yeah, it was so nice. It was so nice to look forward to reading a book. And again, the, the few books that we've read that have been really excellent are almost all books that we've read before or knew going in were going to be excellent and so like those are good but like not since scorpio races have i been so pleased with a book we've read going like oh wow it's not terrible and the funny thing is and i this is going to sound like an insult to this book but i really don't mean it to be but like this is the baseline level of quality i expect from all books like this is the execution on concept that all books should have and the fact that all almost half the books we've read can't meet this level is annoying and irritating and existentially painful painful is a good word for it but you know again this healed us so much after akawar it really I did th- i'm excited for the next <laughs> book i am too it's coming out it looks like january 4th uh 2024 so maybe i'll hold on and release this video closer to then to see if we can maybe get a little bit of that algorithm money um but 
again, I think if you're if you sound if this sounds like an interesting premise to you, I would read it. I think that it's definitely it, it definitely delivers on the premise. Um, and that's such a rare thing. I'm really excited to see what this author does in the future. It's nice to have another author to follow. There are things that, again, I think could have been bigger brained about it. Um, but it's a fun read. I'm going to think about it fondly and I will probably get fonder as I go. Like it's one of those. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that even happens to books I don't love at the time. Like, um, Spending Silver is always the one I use uh, as an example, which like I adore in retrospect. It's very like I'm so fond of that book in retrospect. Three Parts Dead. I'm actually so actually no. Three Parts Dead has rotted a little bit in my brain. Like at the time, I thought I was gonna like it more, but I actually like it a little bit less and part of it for me is because it is a bit messy compared to this and so like yeah it doesn't have the, that distinct feel that flow one thing into the other um that this had it's good i enjoyed it read it it's a good it's so it's so rarely are we like go read it guys <laughs> Do it. <laughs> also join our patreon again you get exclusive videos you get our book club those are such fun those live streams also um katie has an editing service where she will read through your story brainstorm with you fix things talk you through it she's really wonderful um it's beta reading by katie i will put it in a lower third chiron and uh probably put a uh link in the description below um so until we see you again our parasocial darlings bye